glad you all showed up. I didn't think anybody would be here with uh, Jacob speaking at the same time. Thank you, thank you. Um, so the idea for this talk came about through my own experiences uh, learning Django and really any framework. And the, uh, the idea was that I've, my experience has been, let's say I've worked a couple of the basic tutorial with Django, it's the polls app. I've got that down, I got my feet wet, I kind of know where some things are at, and then, and then I want to know where I go next. Um, intermediate tutorials are often like build a blog, build like a to-do list, or some other, not worthless app, but not really that exciting. I mean, you're not, you're not going to be the next person to put a blog platform into production and, you know, or, or any other of those applications. So my experience has been uh, learning from other journalists, a good place to start is using public data to build a Django app, or any app. Um, the public data, using public data, and by public data I mean uh, government data or anything from a government agency. It's a ready-made data set, so it lets you build a less complicated application from the start. Um, in the case, of, we're gonna walk through an, uh, an application I built for the Express News using restaurant inspections. It let me focus on some aspects of the framework, like the kind of the basic core components, like views, templates, my models, the URL routing, to the exclusion of other parts like testing or the uh, admin interface, and those parts are important. But in the beginning, when you're just trying to take the next step up from the basic tutorial, it's, pretty, it's good to focus on the core components that you're gonna be using all the time, and then you can pick a more complicated uh, example after that. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna walk through probably four or five examples of public uh, applications in production that serve public data, and then we're gonna go through some examples of where to get public data. I'm also gonna walk you through a little bit of how to file a freedom of information request. And we're also gonna dig into a little, dig into that uh, restaurant inspections application that I built for the Express News. Um, just, I put the talk up, there's a URL, if you, can, you probably can't read that, Django app from public data .org. I'll, I'll tweet that out. At the very end of the, app, of the uh, slides, I have a link to this, uh, GitHub repo, which has a readme that I kind of wrote out the talk with all the links and a little bit of, kind of a little blurbs of everything that I cover in the talk, so you can just kind of sit back and relax. Uh, all right. First though, I want to go back in time a little bit, a little history. Um, Django was developed in 2003 and 2004 at the Lawrence Journal World. Uh, the story that I heard, and some of you might have lived it, uh, some developers there were essentially building out some web, some components for their CMS, and they built a couple things to solve some problems. When they stepped back, they realized they had a, a framework. Um, the first official release of Django uh, as an open source project was in July of 2005, but a few months before that, in May of 2005, the first non-journal world uh, public Django application was put in pr into production, and that was chicagocrime.org. Chicago Crime was it was a seminal application. I mean, you could say that it was the, one of the first, if not the first application in the news applications, data-driven, data journalism movement. Um, it's been copied a million times by crime apps everywhere. Uh, it was essentially just a scraping of Chicago crime data that Adrian put, uh, mashed up with Google Maps API before there was actually a Google Maps API. Um, so. The very first Django application that was ever built that wasn't with the Lawrence Journal World was built on public data. You can't go wrong. <laughs> Ten years later, Django powers Instagram, Pinterest, Discus, Orbitz, Radio, Mozilla, Prezi, and a whole bunch more. I mean, I just ripped this off from uh, Jacob Kaplan Moss's blog. I mean, you can walk down the halls of this conference and see that it's pretty much like Django is, in many ways, a who's who of the modern internet. And no, that's, that's not a bad at all for a couple guys in Lawrence, Kansas. But it still powers news organizations, LA Times, Texas Tribune, The Atlantic, uh, San Antonio Express News, humbly, S Sunlight Foundation, Chicago Tribune, The Washington Post. Some of these use it for their CMS. I know The Atlantic, they're giving a talk here. Texas Tribune guys are all over here and its alumni. Um, Chicago Tribune, they have their own crime app. We'll look at another application that they have. The New York Times, their interactive news group uh, started out, I think, on Django as far back as 2007. Um, they might have some Django applications in production, but they've since switched to Rails mostly. As we look at these examples, 
your your public your Django application that serves public data will essentially do one thing, and all these applications do this one thing if they don't do anything, and that's essentially take in government data, digest it kind of, so that you're essentially regurgitating it back to the public. Um, the government does what they the government does put data online. They put a lot of it online, but they don't do a very good job of putting it online in any way that's usable for a normal human. Um, and that's, I guess, the cool thing about doing a public app, a Django app from public data, is that, especially early on, it'll let you build an application that people will engage with. I mean, anybody in here in their local community goes back asks for five years of homicide data, puts that online, you're going to get feedback, you're going to get people who know, are interested in it, and it's, even if you're only trying to build out your portfolio to get a, a regular development gig, it's a really cool way to do it. I mean, you're going to generate some conversation, and you're going to generate a little bit of a stir. Um, the first application we'll look at, and all these applications do this, all these, you, you'll be the mama bird. The first application was the uh, Los Angeles Times homicide report. This idea came about with a, uh, a journalist and a developer. The journalist had the idea of reporting on every homicide in LA County. I think it covers five or six years, and there's about 1,000 homicides every year in LA. So the, the database itself is about five or 6,000 homicides. They, the actual database wouldn't, you know, you could easily fit that in an Excel spreadsheet, for example. But it's not going to be very interesting for you to take a look at this Excel spreadsheet. Families aren't going to sit around their kitchen table at night looking at this Excel spreadsheet, digging into homicides in LA County. What this application basically does is serves those homicides back and lets you search, sort, filter in a pretty easy way. It has a nice little map that helps you drill down into a neighborhood. And you can see pretty quickly if you want to look at the men who were, uh, I already got this up, men who were shot in the last year. Or 2014, there was 383. You could do the same thing in your community. You probably don't have the time or the resources to compile data by hand, but you could certainly file an information request to the local police department for the last five, ten years of homicides in your community. The next application is from the oops, is from the Sunlight Foundation. The Sunlight is a nonprofit, nonpartisan uh, journalism foundation in uh, Washington. And they use a lot of different tools. They use traditional journalism, software engineering, data science, basic research. And their idea is to essentially shed light on the way that our civic processes work. Um, one, of the coolest, one of their coolest applications is the Influence Explorer, which essentially aggregates money and politics from a number of different pools of money. Uh, campaign contributions, federal lobbying, federal grants, and uh, federal contracts are four of the big ones. And that, those four account for probably, what, $2 trillion, $3 trillion in money flowing through the government. Each one of those data sets is worth a lifetime of research. What they've done is they've built out an API that you can use. So this would qualify also as a source of data. If you find something interesting that you want to look at, you can uh, use their API or their bulk download to focus on a local county or state level election. What this does is it lets us look at, for example, the 2016 real-time campaign finance. You can see that for your friends that think that Jeb Bush is leading the campaign uh, finance race, he's not. Uh, Hillary Clinton is running away with it right now. And if you've ever looked at Federal Election Commission, I know there's at least one person who has, it is really, really complicated. And the fact that they would do this for you and then build an API out so you could drill down to local, local elections is a really cool thing. The next application is from the Chicago Tribune. Uh, they have their own uh, crime app, but one of the ones I like best is this 2014 Illinois school report cards. The raw data from the Illinois State Board of Education is a pretty gnarly mix of Excel spreadsheets, PDFs, zip files, and it's difficult to imagine, you know, a young family sitting down and digging through this, this data to try to find, research their kid's school. Normal people don't do that. But let's, let's say I want to look at Whittier Elementary. I think there's one. I know Oak Park. So you can see with just a couple clicks in about five seconds, Oak Park is uh, about 80% of the students meet or exceed standards. 
It also gives a, a breakdown of that for reading and math. It gives demographics, class size, and it has some notes on the data. And that, I'm sure they get a lot of traffic from this. That's pretty useful. And all they did was take that data from that school board site and put it back online in this format. And I guarantee you that every state in the United States has some insert state name here at School Board of Education data page. The next up, this one's my favorite. It's from the Texas Tribune, Government Salaries Explorer. What they've done here is they've uh, filed information requests to these different public entities in the state of Texas. They've gone through the work of normalizing how uh, comp the compensation or the ways that these organizations compensate their employees. They all have essentially different fields. Like some have bonuses, some don't, some give comp time, some call it, I don't know, vacation, paid time or whatever. They've normalized that a little bit and then let you search this. And just like homicides, you, if you lived in San Antonio, you could file an information request for all the, or you could just rip it off from here, but I wouldn't do that. It, my point is you could file an information request to your local community, find out how much people in the government make, and put that online. You could file once a year and update your application, and I guarantee you that's going to generate traffic. It's going to generate buzz. It's be a nice, nice little way to make a name for yourself, and it's not going to be that complicated. You don't have to do anything that looks this nice either. Um, I know this still generates a lot of traffic for them, and it's interesting. I mean, it's important to know that, for example, in San Antonio, the, the city manager makes $400,000 a year. That's important. I don't think she's worth that much, but um, an application that I built, we'll dig in this one a little bit more. I use the San Antonio restaurant inspections. Uh, some reporters at the paper were going through, they're online, this is the basic search interface. If you dig in the page source a little bit, you find out that it looks like this. Um, some reporters came and told me that they were or web producers. They were going through this every week and finding the 10 worst, let's say, every week. And then they would do a little slideshow about it, and they put that online. I saw right away, I talked to a couple people who had been with the paper longer than I had, and this website hasn't changed in about five, six years. I don't think it's going to change anytime soon. So I saw right away this is a great way to scrape this data, load it into a database, and we don't have to, do, we can't, we don't have to settle for just the 10 worst. We could do all of them. We could also let people drill down and see you know, what's this, what's this restaurant look like for the past, you know, five years, six years? All right. We'll look, take a, look, a, bigger, a deeper look at that in a sec. The website that I built, the Django application, all it does is take those restaurant inspections and put it online. It goes, it goes from this to this. And because from the outset, the, the task I wanted to accomplish was simple. The code is correspondingly pretty straightforward. The, uh, we'll look at the repository in a minute, and you'll see that if you take the, the polls application, the polls, well, that's your basic tutorial of Django, and put it right next to this code, you'll see that at this point in Django, it's one of the first things I built. I didn't really know much more than that, so I simply wanted to take, I did this one tutorial, how do I take that and essentially extrapolate it out to something that's live and something that actually does something different, that it doesn't do polls. It does restaurant inspections. There's four views. Oops, where is it? The first view was an index view. This was the 500 most recent inspections sorted by date, which amounts to about, I haven't updated in the last week or two, but it amounts to about like, you know, about two weeks worth. There's an inspections view. Don't go to Rocky's Tacos. The inspections view is, so the index view is the 500 most recent inspections. The establishment view is all the inspections for a particular establishment. I call this the inspection view, which is all the violations, descriptions of those violations associated with each inspection. And then the last view is a basic search. Four views, that's it. And this is essentially the index view all over again. Oops, don't do that. Four views, four templates. An, an index template, the first template you saw, an establishment template, an inspection template, and a search template. And the search template, like a, and a base, they all inherit from base. And the uh, search is essentially the index. 
And I, I didn't even try to deal with pagination. I just use, uh, I just use the uh, data tables jQuery uh, or JavaScript library. I have three models. Probably the most imp Here we are. The models aren't that complicated at all. Probably the hardest part of this whole application would be trying to get the data in its raw form shoehorned into a model. And that, if you weren't experienced and hadn't worked with data a lot, that could be a little daunting. But it wouldn't be anything that, you know, going to your local Django users group or Python users group, or even cheating and going to the Rails users group, they'll sit down to help you out. I mean, it's not, it's just, a, you know, how do you, how do you take data that looks a little weird and make it look like this. Uh, every establishment has many inspections, and every inspection has many descriptions, and that was mostly just a function of the way that they put the data online. Probably the thing that I learned the most from, that I had the most trouble with, was the views. And I wouldn't say trouble, it was just getting this down, you know, playing with, and this was a chance to play around with the database, play around with the ORM, learn how the Django queries work. If you're familiar with SQL, then it should be pretty easy to figure out, but if not, it's, this can be a little, this can be a, where you're grateful that you don't have a complicated application so you can spend some time learning this, because this is important stuff. Every Django application you have is gonna go to the database and it's gonna have some views. The first one, the index view, like I said, was the 500, most recent inspections. The establishment view uses the establishment ID and just gets all the establishments ordered by date for that establishment. The inspection was gets all the descriptions for every inspection. I had to make up an inspection key, which that's where things got a little weird. And then the search, which is essentially just a basic like wildcard search on uh, any text you put in the text box. Find me names like that. All right. Sources, where do you get this stuff? We talked about one, the Sunlight Foundation has an API that you can use. Another good place, although a lot of data journalism types don't like data.gov, it is a decent place to start. It has, now at this point, it has 160,000 different data sets. It has data on about every, every subject imaginable. Um, I think this is also a good place to start because they have a, an applicate, they have example applications if you want to take a look at that. They have a little developer's portal. Sometimes you'll see code challenges advertised or corporations that have, are giving grant money. And this is just a good, once you get started, once you let's say build a Django application and, and test the civic data waters, you can keep going down this for a long time and maybe you won't make a living out of it, but it's a great place to just get involved build cool projects, there's a great community of folks out there, it's a great way to open, data journalism open source projects, especially ones run by journalists, are a great way to get involved with open source projects. A lot of journalists have become essentially software developers by default with what they do in their jobs, but they didn't start out as computer science people, and so they're very amenable to helping people out, and there's a lot of folks who just learned, taught themselves to code in the newsroom, and it's just a great little community to get involved with to learn and grow, and this is a place to start. Probably one of my favorite data sets of all time is the census data, but the census data, if you know about it from the Census Bureau or American Fact Finder, is horrific at best. Uh, some journalists got together and filed the Knight Foundation grant to essentially make uh, census data cool. It's censusreporter.org, it is itself a Django app, and it is a, an open source Django app. So you could run your own uh, censusreporter.org if you want. I put this in here because it's a good place to just know about what is involved with census data. Like what is actually available? What can I, what's in that data set and what can I find? And you can check out, it has pretty much everything. Median age, income, commute, transportation, households, fertility, marriage, whatever, veteran status. So if you're just looking for a way to break into census data and you wanna know a little about it, what it entails, what it, what it can give you, this is a place to start. Once you kind of drill down and think, this is what I would like to look at in my community, 
or across the United States, let's say. Let's say you want to compare all the United States based on one data point. Instead of going to the Census Bureau again, I would go to census.ire.org. This idea came about, and all, this is essentially what data journalism is, is the government does a bad job of putting data online. How can we do that job better? Some journalists were frustrated with how the census put data online. They wanted to make it easy for people to, to look at and get. So instead of navigating the many, many uh, drop downs that are American Fact Finder, let's say you want to look at counties. You wanted to look at Texas. And we'll do Aransas County. This lets you look, lets you see the data that you want on the right, and it lets you toggle whether or not you wanted to add certain data sets in. And then you can download it. It doesn't get much easier than this. If you've ever, I can't tell you how bad American Fact Finder is. It is not this easy. So I would just forget that, pretend that this is the actual government census data, and this is where you get it from. Your own community also will have data online. San Antonio was not a leader in this by any way, but even they have data. They have this GIS data portal, which has shape files. If you want to explore GeoJangle, for example. Um, I found the city's restaurant inspections online. And there's other, there's like a random uh, 911 calls, but only for certain kinds of calls. Any community that you, all of you, if you went home to your hometown, looked at their city's website and just poked around, you'd find some data online. They're supposed, to put it, they're supposed to put a lot more than they do online. A lot of them don't have the resources to do that. But that's a good place to start if you just want to find something that's a data set that they thought was important enough to put online. That means it's probably interesting. It also means that it's probably in some crappy table format that you could scrape, which is a good reason to scrape. And then you can start updating a data set in real time, let's say, or weekly. And government data is sometimes a good, a good data set to scrape because they don't have a lot of money to change these websites all the time, so they're going to build it once and let it sit there for like 15 years. <laughs> but I would encourage you to, the first place I would check is probably your own local hometown, just to see what, what they have online, because there's going to be nuggets there. I also included this slide, uh, I mean 30 places to find open data on the web. You could have Googled that yourself, but there's a lot. I mean, it goes from city-specific spe government data to data aggregators to uh, social, me social media data, weather, sports. The New York Times, The Guardian both have pretty interesting APIs. The last thing I wanted to talk about was uh, freedom of information requests. All of you can file those. I think a lot of people think that you know, they have to be a journalist to file them, but they don't. And this is probably one of the best ways to get data because the government will just send it to you. And like homicide data, not a, lot of webs not a lot of city governments are gonna put homicide data online or their own salary data online, but you can ask for that, and they by law have to give it to you. Um, it can be a little daunting, I don't wanna say daunting, but the easiest way to do it is probably to go through this website, ifoia.org. It's run by the uh, Committee for Freedom of the Press, and what this does is it helps walk you through the FOIA process. You can log in, start an account, and it will give you a template. There's a, the language is, there's not a required language for a FOIA request, but there are certain kind of agreed upon ways that you would ask for it. Um, you log in, they generate the letter for you, and then once it's generated, if the agency that you want to send the request to has already been is already in their system, they'll send it to the person or to the, the PIO, the public information officer of the organization that you're looking at. If it's not, if that person is not in there or that organization is not in there, that government department, you can do a little research on your own and contribute that back. Another cool thing about this is that there can be a little bit of back and forth with filing one of these things. Normally it would go, you file one, And then they, by law, have to either give you the data. In Texas, it's 10 days. I think it's 10 days. It's 10 days. If they can't get it to you in 10 days, they have to say, all right, we can't get it to you in 10 days. We need a little extension. So they have to get back to you within 10 days no matter what. And there can be some back and forth. They can sometimes charge you like $4,000, which you can say that's ridiculous. 
and then you can kind of bargain with them a little bit and say, this is, I do this for a living too. It doesn't take three weeks to dump a MySQL database. Um, <laughs> that happens. Uh, yeah. Another thing is, you could, I mean, you could generate like a, a legal case. I, I filed a request once in Arkansas and they just wouldn't give it to me at all. And essentially it's like, I documented it. Like there's a back and forth, back and forth, they didn't respond. And I just kind of bundled all that up and sent it off to the Arkansas Attorney General. It said, hey look, I asked for this data, it was consumer complaint data. There's no reason why they shouldn't get it. They didn't give me a response. And they legally are supposed to. And that, you know, started a little legal case and the Attorney General gets on top of the agency that I was asking for. And that you should do that. It's not, you know, it wasn't me going out of my way or anything. It was just essentially bundling up all my communications I had with them, sending it off and saying, hey, this is not right. They should, Attorney General's like, no, it's not right. Uh, we'll talk to him about it. This does all that for you. It's a cool, a really cool resource. And uh, you should sign up and file some, for, I, I thought journalists filed most freedom of information requests, but it's actually like hedge funds and uh, consulting groups and stuff like that. So, you know, you don't want to let the hedge funds get all the good data. <laughs> like I said, I'll tweet this link out at the end. Uh, it has a link to the README for this talk, and it has a link to the inspections repository, which is the restaurant inspections, which is a nice example of a production level Django app that's not very complicated and it's pretty accessible. Uh, that's it, thank you. Uh, I don't know if any of the uh, Texas Tribune people are here, but um, sorry. Um, one of the things they did that I thought was interesting, and I'm wondering if you have any experience with this, is using Django's form or model validations to do data cleanup, or at least to uh, flag you of incomplete data during an ingest of some kind. Uh, I haven't done that. Well, I have used, I use the basic like, I guess I'll repeat the question. The question was, do I use Django model validations to validate, invalidate it. Travis, I don't know, did you do that? So I'm former Texas Tribune. Um, a lot of the data apps that I worked on there, uh, we actually had to get away from the ORM as quickly as possible on ingest, just because the ORM uh, is slow when you're importing 10 million records, so. And I just used basic, uh, I split the data up into CSVs and then I used there's a lot, of, the data is a little weird from the city of San Antonio, so I just use the basic, like, I built in that inspection key, and then I just make sure that it's not duplicated in. Uh, and their data's not terrible. I mean, I've dealt with a lot worse, but that is a good idea. That's their idea. <laughs> and their ORM is slow. Hi, uh, you mentioned before that uh, when you were looking at data.gov, you said that a lot of data journalists or a lot of journalists don't like to use the information from that site. Is there a, a reason for that? Or? No, I, I think it's not the information that they don't like. It's just that they seem to have thought like they, th I think the, over, the overriding idea was that they expect a little more from it, I guess. I don't know, I don't know why that is. I've just heard grumblings at like, you know, around the bar or whatever that, oh, you know, I, too bad it sucks. Um, <laughs> but it's never backed up by that. So I just, you know, wanted to say that in case there's somebody out there who said too bad it sucks. Uh, I, I think it's fine. I mean, they, the, it is just a dump, though. I mean, it's not, they just put up, they didn't, you know, do a lot of, they put up 160,000 data sets, and I guarantee you they didn't put much work. They just, oh, you got some? Put it up there. Um, so that's where the work comes in, what you're going to be doing with this. So maybe they wanted some cleaning or some organization or something like that. And maybe uh, 18F is the government's answer to that. I don't know. I wonder if you would consider also open sourcing or sharing your scraping Python stuff just to be uh, a good model for. Yeah, um, yeah, I could do that. There's also yeah. a lot of uh, even better than stuff that I've written, and the stuff that I wrote. Actually, I wrote this in Ruby. This is a while back, um, so I feel like some some sort of traitor. But <laughs> uh, there's a lot of cool examples of scraping uh, within the journalism community. Like I can point out a couple, and I'll put these links in the in the README. Um, 
a couple tutorials written by journalists, maybe, I can even think of three or four, that are really good. Oh, I don't know. But yeah, that, there's another one. I mean, I can think of, I just think of people that I know who have written scraping tutorials um, from the standpoint of journalism, and they're really good. Uh, and they're, and I'll, I'll put those links in the readme. Yeah. Uh, well, there's a Texas GitHub repo. We should probably get you on that. There's a bunch of scrapers there if you're interested in pre-existing Texas government data scrapers and some Django projects there too that are open source. Yeah, it's good, yeah. I wrote some stuff for the uh, Railroad Commission, which is a whole other issue. Any other questions? We have a little bit more time. If you have a burning question, please don't hesitate. <laughs> Tell me when you file a FOIA request. That'll make me happy. Um, I've heard other talks, including a, um, a TED talk you may have seen, like the one on um, people doing open data stuff with, with stuff provided by the state of New York. And I've heard repeatedly like how bad the data is. Like maybe they use inconsistent IDs for the same thing. They use inconsistent formats. You may even be trying to scrape it from something that's not actually like machine parsable. Easily, like in, in your experience, like how how bad is the data formatting? I guess. So I guess the question is, how bad is the data formatted? It, I guess it, it, in my experience, it depends on on the data set. Some of them aren't that bad. Some of them are horrible. Um, some of them are horrible. Uh, be, beyond beyond imagining. Um, and that I would. To stay with the premise of this talk, if you find one of those, I would just pick another data set. Uh, because, yeah, some of them are like, I've spent, you know, two months on a data set that's, that you ne and we need for an investigation. Maybe that's an exaggeration. But I've spent a lot of time on horrible data. I know everybody else, Chris has, and I'm sure that Travis has. It's unreal how bad the data is, and the government doesn't care. A lot of the problems, though, with data journalism is that you're essentially taking a data set and making it do something usually that it wasn't intended to in the first place. And I point that out to a lot of people who are upset with the way the data works. It's like, well, you know, it did what they wanted it to do. What you want to do isn't what they wanted it to do in the first place, so bear that in mind. But it can get pretty hairy, and I would just pick another data set then, unless you want to spend the time. I mean, also, though, if it's really bad and you were interested in it, probably somebody else would be too. So that would be a great open source project in and of itself. I'm on a human rights committee in my county, and one person on the committee uh, asked for um, like demographic data of the uh, constituents in the county jail, and they got a response that it's gonna cost us much money, and we don't have any money, so that it just kind of died a year or two ago. And so I'm interested if you could tell us a little bit more about when you've been told that's gonna cost this much, and yeah. you kind of do the bargaining. The where back where was forth. that? Uh, in Michigan. Okay. Um, so, like, how do you, how do you do the bargaining? And yeah. if you do end up needing to pay, are there like people out there who help pay for that? Or um, so, I guess the question is, how do you bargain in a, in, a, in a FOIA request, or how do you sort of barter or whatever? Um, what I would usually do is, like, I, I don't know what they said, but let's imagine in this case they come back and they say, you know, it's going to cost two thousand uh, dollars to dump a MySQL database. Well, we all know that it doesn't co it doesn't take more than, and I understand that. Like, I'm not one of those, having done it on my own, I'll give you a day and a half, even two days of work. Because sometimes it's not as easy as it sounds. I mean, people in the newsroom think, how long does it take? I'll give you a day. And, you know, these people make, let's say, 50 bucks an hour. And that, that, that would be like 400. So you can start with that. That's like, look, it should take you a day, maybe a day and a half. That's maybe a little stretching it. But, you know, six hours of work in an eight-hour workday is a ton of work. And that, that's a way to start. Let's say four to 600. And that will get you down from the 2,000. And then you can just ask them to give you an itemized account, like why is it costing so much? And look, talk to somebody who, if you're not experienced or with the, the technologies involved, talk to somebody. You know, I've asked around, we ran into a situation where they were giving us like an Oracle dump. And it was like 2000, this was the state of Texas. And it was, a, we talked to some Oracle people and they're like, no, no, it shouldn't be that hard. And then you can go to them with that and say, look, I've talked to some professionals. I can put you in touch with them. This you know, this young woman w writes Oracle every day. She works on Oracle databases all the time. She's saying there's no way it should take that long. Uh, and it's just, it, 
if they start out at some ridiculous level, like I don't know how much, did, did they tell you, how much was it? So he just said, for the recording, it, it might have been a couple thousand dollars. Yeah. Is it, so it's okay to ask them what yeah. technology, what, what database yes. are you using? How is this stored? Yeah. That's all fine. You got you to gotta pretend you're a reporter. You got to be really annoying okay. uh, and be as obnoxious as you can. Yeah. And just, I want an itemized, I want to know, and I'm not very good at it either. I'm not, I'm more of a people pleaser than I am obnoxious. But you know, give, tell me exactly an itemized breakdown of why it costs so much. And just be really nice, too. Like, they, they, it's within, and you can also say, you can, at the very end, you can go to the attorney general and you can say, you know, this is uh, unreasonable. And, but show them why it's unreasonable. You know, like, if they say it's in my sequel and it's going to cost $2,000, that's crazy. Um, and you can also, I've never done this, but I've also offered, I've heard of people offering to show them, let's say that someone who doesn't know what they're doing, and they say, well, it's in this MySQL thing, and it's going to cost $2,000. And they could just be afraid, and they could just be making a number up. So you can say, hey, look, it shouldn't cost that much. If you don't know how to do it, I can show you how. You know, I can walk you through dumping the database or, or converting it or however to save you time. You know, it's mostly just this, like, it's, it's arduous, but... Mm -hmm. And then I don't know, there is nobody that will help you pay. I mean, I know a lot of people, the federal government can take years... Um, but it doesn't sound like the, you know, the contents of the county jail shouldn't take that long. Sure. And I would hit them back now. Yeah. Okay, that would be cool. Or you, universities too, maybe you could talk to a local university or like a local, like University of Michigan Journalism Department, see if they want to get interested. Good. All right. Thank you so much, Joe. That was fantastic. Thank you.